Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Junior Doan, and welcome to Junior Doan's A Spark. Our guest today is Sarah Whiting, and we are going to talk about the origination and development of the Dow Gardens Whiting Forest Canopy Walk, which opened less than a year ago in fall of 2018. This month, the Matrix Midland Festival presented a program on the Dow Gardens Whiting Forest Canopy Walk, including Alan Metcalf, the designer, and Mike Whiting, the president of the Herbert H. and Grace A. Dow Foundation, which was the funder. We did a lecture by both of them, including a slideshow, as well as a tour led by them of the Canopy Walk. Sarah, Mike's wife, uh, had an integral role in some of the features that came forward and how it was executed. So welcome, Sarah. I know you had a significant role in the development of this whole wonderful adventure for Midland. But tell me, how, what was the development like and what were the discussions like? Well, at, at the beginning, you know, we, we knew that we had this gorgeous piece of property, the 55 acres, that had a house, a log cabin, and basically natural forests with a two ponds of elevation. So the discussions were, what do we do with this? We know that forests are special for people. We know that forests speak to your soul. We, we know that calming. Want, they're calming. Once you get in there, there's been so many studies on they lower your blood pressure, your cortisol levels, um, but, they just, but we all inherently know they speak to your soul. So these are the forests that Mike grew up playing in as a kid. How do we get other people to come in and enjoy it and use it? So that was really the start of the whole discussion on what to do, is here we have this blank canvas of a forest. So what were some of the suggestions? Well, there were ideas. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, well, there were. So we're trying to get a little bit of an adrenaline rush in today's society. How do you get anyone to go anywhere? Well, you have to draw them there. You don't want to yeah. tell them to go there. You want to draw them there. So adrenaline rush. You know what adrenaline rush? Zip lines. Well, should we do a zip line? Oh my gosh, how cool would that be? You know, Costa Rica has them. You're like hundreds of feet in the air, zipping around, and and we thought maybe that's not quite the right thing. So not zip line, maybe shorter zip lines. Didn't really have the punch. Um, we started thinking about uh, slides in the forest because of all the elevation change. And there are there are places, you know, Mike and I have had a great time in our life and lot, uh, lives together, traveling through forests and gardens around the world. There's one um, that's just got slides. It's just got maybe 15, 20 long slides, 150 foot long slides. <clears throat> and then we thought, well, maybe that's not quite it. And then we thought art. Art draws you in. Art brings emotion to a space. What about art? You know, you've got Storm King, you've got Minor yes. Gardens, um, you've got forests and you've got gardens with art. So, but there are forests. In Northern Scotland, there's a forest with art. And we thought that might be it. Um, and then we went to Versailles. And Versailles is like the number one garden slash forest, because it does have forested areas. And um, I could talk about Versailles for hours, but I'll just cap encapsulate it in. We went to Versailles and we realized it wasn't just looking at art that you wanted to do, it was the experience of being there. And so Mike and I wanted people to come to Whiting Forest and experience what something different, something that would bring them emotion, something that would, would bring their mind somewhere else. But then we also wanted them to come to Whiting Forest and experience the forest. Mm -hmm. So how do you do it? We want the art or whatever it is to be a great experience, but we want the forest to work its magic. We want whatever it is to bring them there with an adrenaline rush, but then fade into the background and let them experience the forest. So that's where we came to the, some sort of an art of a canopy walk to get them there. We looked at many other things besides the canopy walk. What about just bridges? 
What about um, lots of bridges? Because when you walk over a bridge, isn't it a different experience? And a transition. And a transition, exactly, exactly. Oh my gosh, transition. Okay, so the designers of the Canopy Walk would love that you picked up on that because the Canopy Walk is a um, transitioning from the ground to the air, overlooking the sky, inside the trees, and the virtue, and that transition concept is huge for them. And maybe you've just verbalized something that Mike and I have been trying to get to as we want people to get that transition. Yes, I've been pleased. But it's, it's not only a transition, it's that experience life differently, because usually we look up or down or we don't trip. Mm -hmm. Right, but this is being up, you can go further, but now you're looking down, 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 down. Yes. Which is a different perspective as a human being in a functioning world. Yeah, you change, change in perspective is crucial. And, um, and when we physically change perspective, that kinesthetic learning, uh, our minds are maybe changing a little perspective in themselves. We can look at things differently. Why do we love to travel? We love to see a change. We love to see something from a different perspective. Why do you like walking up into the trees? Why do people inherently love getting up into a tree? Curiosity. Yeah, curiosity. What's up there? What does it look like when I'm up there? Just you know, and risk, perhaps. And there's if you're going to climb up, you might fall down, or yes. you might get to the top and look and see, see something. Yes. So, Sarah, when when you when you sort of figured out. Because you, you went to, didn't you feel, go to Philadelphia and, and look at the smaller yes. one? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that impressed you how? Um, well, the, 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 there was some inherent beauty in it. You were, when you got to the entrance of it, you were drawn to walk onto it. And it had more than we had thought it was going to have. It had this big, huge uh, cargo netting um, that, at, at one end, which was really cool because you didn't just walk out there and then walk back. You walked out there and you stayed. You stayed for like 20, 30 minutes. You laid on it and you just looked up into the trees and, and that was one of the big things um, was getting people to look up, you know. Um, look up, just connect to the higher world out there. Don't just look this way, you're looking up. Um, but it was also the experience of it. You know, you're not just walking through, and walking through on some pathway or on some bridge, just walking from one place to the other. It really made you pause. Did they have this? You can go in either direction. Um, they theirs was much shorter. Um, it was two this directions. Fourteen hundred feet here. Yes, this yes. is the longest one in the country, um, and this is all fully ADA accessible, which was important to us. Um, theirs is much shorter, um, and and about the same height. I think theirs is about forty-five feet height at the highest. Ours gets up to about forty. Uh, and they have two branches, um, much shorter okay. branches, but they have the carbon at one end, and then they have a bird's nest at the other that you can't really see through much. It goes all the way up. And we, we wanted to be able to see at each end. How do they decide how high to make it? Is it a relationship with the height of the trees? Is it uh, something to do with mechanical ability to build in a certain kind of way? We, we, each of the three arms is as high as we could make it, um, doing the one foot for 12 feet. You know, oh, yes. Day. So that was a very limiting factor for us. Um, limiting in terms of the height. Yes. Um, was, you know, well, it's only so far out you can go over the pond. I guess we could have spanned the entire pond, but, you know, we, we were working in a, in, a, in a very generous budget. So it was, just, you know, that's as far as we can go in the budget. And, you know, 1,400 feet. We, that was so long. We were, I know. We were like, wow, this is the longest one, but let's do it. Let's do it. We had the three arms. We didn't want to sacrifice any of the arms. So how did you and, uh, and Alan and Mike work together on it? Did he come in and give you three or four or two variations or what his ideas were? Were there a lot of back and forth? Was there not a lot of back and forth? There was a, there, it was a great collaboration. And, and Alan and Mike and I were really the three creative influences on the design. Um, Alan has an assistant, Chris, who's fabulous as well. Um, and other, many other people would, would come in with ideas. So, so not to cut anybody out of that process, but the three of us, probably for about two years. Um, it started with Alan being here for three or four days with Mike and I, walking through the forest constantly, just day, all day long. Jonathan Alderson, the landscape architect, was involved at the very beginning. Um, 
with knowledge about the trees and the... They did beautiful yeah. one. Oh, yeah. just fantastic. And there's one great photograph that we have of Mike and Jonathan and Alan standing at the spot where um, the entrance to the Canopy Walk currently is, yeah. trying to find one of the highest spots in the entire forest that would have it, or actually not the highest spot, a spot that would have the largest delta, or not delta, change in yes. the height. So that we could start from there and get the benefit of getting out to that orchard arm so high yeah. with not having to go past the one in 12. Um, but so we, we would meet for, we probably had three or four meetings that were maybe three or four days long. Did you vary the season, or that didn't matter? Yes, we varied the season, some in the cold, some in the summer, because you know, with, with the uh, cold, there's a lot of pines, but there's a lot of deciduous trees. Yes. So we wanted to make sure it looked great in both seasons. Um, they wanted to know a lot from Mike about what parts of the forest that he particularly liked as a kid, what was special to him. And then they also had other parts that they thought were special, and they wanted to know what I thought was special. And, you know, did we want this to be a really active forest in the entire thing? Did we want it to be more passive? Did we want the changes? Um, and it, it was, uh, and then so after those, and they would come with, the first thing they came with was just a point with three spokes. And that was their first thought of, we have three places we want. We want the air, the, we want the air, the trees, and the water. You know, very integral to uh, yeah. the forest and what humans like. And then it grew from there. And I give Alan total credit for the beauty of the canopy walk. Because to me, when you're doing, it, it's, it's, it's like installation art. Because yes. it's just beautiful, but it's the people walking on it, experiencing it while they're walking. You're not just looking at a two-dimensional painting. You're, and you're not even just walking around a sculpture. You are inside of this. One of the things I learned at the lecture mm -hmm. that Mike and Alan did for yeah. Matrix was Alan talked about risk, perceived and real. Mm -hmm. So since you had taken me around before it opened, you and I, and with Alexandra, but still, I, I never really knew to that lecture, and then he took the tour, that the glass overhang with the floor is sort of perceived risk, mm -hmm. but if you jump on it, it creates, I guess, um, waves of energy, and if they're strong enough, the, I don't know what you'd say, those steel pipes, the orange. Yeah, they're, they're like rebar, re but painted bright orange and brown. Yes. And they hit against each other and they make music. Yes. yes. I was uh, really taken with that, that you go from risk, perceived risk, to beauty. <laughs> yes, oh, exactly. If that, if that's a really good point. That perceived risk doesn't make you sort of, all your senses are more attenuated. You know, when you're perceiving risk, everything is like, wow, you know, what's going on? And then all of a sudden you hear this lovely noise of the clanging. Um, the same thing out on the pond arm. You know, if you start shaking it, you know, that pond arm will shake, it will sway like the trees do. And then all of a sudden you'll start hearing the clanging of, you know, branches against it. And it's Is there a weight maximum at either of those places? There is, I don't know what it is, but they said the number of people that would be smushed on there still wouldn't get to it. So okay. physically, you can't get enough people on there to, to break it. Okay, and, that's and really civil right. Two civil engineers were in every single meeting. I mean, all of our, we had twice weekly meetings for, after those original creative meetings, we had twice weekly conference calls on oh, like two mornings this. a week. High and communication. Those, oh, it was, it was twice a week, every single week. What, I mean, Christmas week, maybe we only did once that week. But yes, twice a week for almost two years. And we'd have certain parts we'd focus on, we'd see how they were doing. Um, it, was, it was very intense um, collaboration. One of the nice things about the terrace, I was through, a friend of mine, I walked the two bridges, the yeah. Africa Dow Gardens and also the library, Grace A. Dow Library. Yes. Uh, that we could sit outside yes. and not only inhale more of the forest, but watch the playground. Yes. Now, how did the playground and its design get developed? Okay, that, that, of all these things that I've been so excited about at Whiting Forest, that is the one that excites me the most. Um, that is the sixth playground I've had the honor to be able to help design. Um, playgrounds to me, way back when our older son was one, and he's now 38, <laughs> so a long time ago, I saw the need for playgrounds in, in people's lives. Um, you know, first, I, I, 
this is a, um, I mean, it's just fun to be at a playground. Kids need to learn to play. We all inherently know they need exercise, they need running, they need jumping. They need to interact with other kids that they know and kids they don't know. Another thing playgrounds do, though, in my mind, is it's a, it really helps ease the burden of parents with kids that are really active. I mean, it might help yes. prevent some child abuse. It might help yes. make a happier family. You know, it's four o'clock, oh my gosh, let my kid go out there and play, but, be, but design it so it has a fence around it with one gate, so the parent doesn't have to be constantly, where's my kid? Or design it so the little kids can be on one side, the bigger kids on another, so the little kids don't get trampled. Um, make sure there's lots of seating for the parents. Make sure the seating isn't just a bench looking out, it's two benches, so that the parents might end up talking to each other. I mean, there's all this intention in the design of the playground. So. Um, I really wanted to have a playground here at Whiting Forest, and if it was in the budget, I was going to be thrilled. And Alan Metcalf and his group really worked hard with us. Um, it's probably about five times as big as they would have wanted it to be, but I think when you go out there and see the kids running around, I, I, I just knew they would love it. I just knew that the kids will come to it, because they, you know, the concept was, we have this forest, why do we want it on the playground? And I agree with Richard Liu, who wrote The Nature, you know, the Deficit Disorder and The Last Child in the Woods, that you want to attract kids to the woods because kids that are attracted to the woods will then go into the woods and they will grow up to be adults who love the woods. Oh, nice. So let's attract those kids as they're young, give them a spectacularly aesthetically pleasing as well as um, fun playground, and they're right there and there's this path that just goes in the woods. So, uh, at one of the openings, I went to the playground and I played <laughs> on the swings oh, and on that little nest or whatever it is. So, I was just wondering, do you have any ideas for an adult playground? That was actually in our plan and it might be coming down the pike, who knows. We had an idea for an uh, adult swing that was about 30 feet long. 30 feet, you know, the, the sides were 30 feet long, so an adult swing, or several of them, and adult seesaws, that was something, and then oh, I like that. the adults, uh, yeah, seesaw, I mean, to be honest, a seesaw as an adult, I mean, how fun, that feeling of up and down, Why? oh, just, yeah, yeah, exactly, and then, um, and then the slides, we, we have a base for two adult slides, I mean, kids, of course, can use them, but adult slides that, um, I mean, maybe like 60, 75, 100 feet long, <laughs> we have that base. Yeah, and, and very safe, very safe, but you know, part of a forest and part of projects like this is, you know, the Dow Foundation is in this for the long haul. Yes. So, you don't need to expose everything at first. And it will be adequately maintained. Oh, but yes. That's exactly. You have to pay attention to. So, Sarah, I know from just knowing you that you had a long interest in baseball because <clears throat> of your sons yeah. and you were almost the head of sequencing these various tournaments throughout Florida. Mm -hmm. What did you learn from that? Oh, that's a cool question. Um, I, learned, I learned, number one, that it's not about me. It's not about me, and I'm happiest when it's not about me. I, 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 I so enjoy being involved in that project because that was 11 years and quite a big job. It was a college with that baseball league of six teams. Um, but when I was out there and it was about other people, it was about either the employees, it was about the interns, it was about the players, it was about the community that came to the game, because some of our games, you know, most of our games got maybe 800 to 1,000 people, but some got 2,500. And if I really walked into it and thought, okay, this whole night, this whole game is about everybody else here, it's just so fun. It is just so fun when you can remove yourself and just say, I'm just going to give what I can give, I'm going to plan what I can plan. I love it. Uh, working with your husband, do you think that's changed your relationship in any way? More respect for him. Totally more respect for him. For this Whiting Forest project, you know, I got to be involved in the creative side. Um, I absolutely liked that. Lots of work, but I just loved it. The people were just high level. Mike was involved in that. He's more creative than people think. Um, he just doesn't need to, he doesn't need to be telling people about himself. He's, he's very creative. But he also was the mastermind behind you know, the whole financing, the timeline of, of how do you structure this, and, and yes, this, no, that, and oh my gosh, and the people. Much respect for him, because he does it. He, do, he does it living every day in service to others. Yeah, but, oh, I like that. He does. He, it's, he gets up in the morning, and um, I think you can share this feeling of, of Ted, who we loved, and Mike, I admired, and Mike truly, truly respect, respected. 
it, doing it in service for others. Getting up going, yeah, I'm going to do this. I could go play golf, but I'm going to do this because this is a good thing to do. This is the right thing to do, and I'm able to do it. And yes. What, what, a, what a joy and what a gift. It is a gift to serve. It is a gift. It takes you higher, and it opens the doors of possibility for so many. Mm -hmm. may not have the imagination or dreams. It's really good. Then when Ted and I did a lot of residential building for ourselves, and one of the things that I so adored, and he must have because he kept doing it, is the intellectual inter interchange of possibility. Mm -hmm. You know, if you do this, then what about this? Or are there alternates? Get out the papers and let's draw. And have we considered what did we miss? And I yeah. appreciated that because um, in terms of a marriage, it was a different partnership, you know, and Ted and I, he had his life, I had my life, we had our life, we had the parent life, and this was some of the many projects we did together. And I thought that brought us great joy. And I think it helped that he was an engineer, because he, <laughs> just like Mike is, he would scream, you know, some of our ideas technically. And I think that's useful to have Mm -hmm. All that as a uh, not a, not as an exactly a fence, but a reminder. Let's solve the technical as we're dreaming. You know, make it make it happen that way. So, Sarah, what did you learn from building playgrounds? Is space? Is there different materials? Is it mm -hmm. do different families want different things? Is geography or weather an issue? Uh, what I uh, from playgrounds, you know, having. I wasn't the one with the pen to paper actually doing the materials and the safety codes and things like that. But what the people that were doing that design sometimes missed was how did the families interact? How did the kids and families interact with each other and with the playground? And um, so I think that's what I brought, I brought to it. The, fi the five playgrounds in Winter Park that I, I helped design were all very different. We raised what was there and just started from scratch. Um, such as having fencing all around so it's safe, so there's only one exit, having the seating differently, um, having it so it's it's very creative play that the kids can do. It's not um, you know true nature. A true nature playground is very trendy these days, which is you know dirt and rocks and sticks and whatever. That has its place. That's not what we wanted to do. We I wanted to do something with um, beautiful materials, aesthetically beautiful. And yet, giving the kids that um, the ability to do the logic choices—you know, should I go here? Should I go there? That's all these round circles and these round forms. How do I get through that? How do I go through the tunnel? How do I climb up there? And a little bit of risk. This playground has these big rocks, and you climb on those rocks, and, and you can fall down. And it's got the water feature, which is yeah. really important to me because that is such fun play for kids and so creative. It is great. Um, you know, that kids are so programmed, and I'm. I'm not negative on programmed things. I mean, you know, teaching kids, you know, group sports and things is very important. And Legos are fabulous. That's very creative, but they're very formed. Just getting to a playground and going, oh wow, I don't have anything to play with, but here's this water feature. Let me figure out what to do. And the kids inherently know how to have fun. So I'm we're just curiosity. helping that. Exactly, just helping that. And but the biggest thing from playgrounds was community. It builds community. You know, you've mentioned that before a couple of times, and I've been pondering. How did that come into your life, the sense of the importance of community of working together? <laughs> I can remember exactly when it came into my life, because I, I helped with those playgrounds um, in Winter Park, and then I went on to um, work at our church and do outreach to um, people that were, were ill and you know going through an illness, I helped them um, you know, in many different ways. And then I worked at the schools and I helped with science, because I'm an engineer, as you know, as well, so I worked with science. In, in lower schools and also with high school kids, tutoring them. And then I was the president of the library. I was on the library board in Winter Park and that. And then this baseball thing came along. And I'm thinking, I'm the president of the baseball league and the commissioner, and I don't play baseball. And I'm like, what, what, how is that? All of these things have given me fulfillment. And then I realized the commonality was every single thing that gave me fulfillment was because it was the people coming together. And I'm okay to work on other different aspects, but everything I was doing was bringing people together. and People of a certain attitude or just anybody together? Anybody. I mean, the library does bring people together who uh, admire the written word, you know, but how did we, but we wanted to make it more accessible to everybody. We had lots more magazines and newspapers. We put up a coffee shop, you know, things like that. So it was 
Um, it was bringing any, any people together. People that happened to live together or in the baseball, it wasn't even people lived together. People would drive two hours to come to our games. People that liked college baseball or baseball. But it's bringing them together and honoring that feeling that we're all in this world together. You have a very spiritual side, I know that personally. How does that play into who you are in the real world? Um, one of my hopes has been to blur the edge between my spiritual side and my everyday world side. I think I, that has been a goal of mine since college, actually. Was, you know, you can go somewhere, I can be by myself, I can be spiritual, I can think things, I could write a poem. Um, you know, I could just have like epiphanies. And then I'd go to my, you know, real world and I'd be like, okay, here I am, you know, okay, writing this paper and having to do this and whatever, and trying to blur that. So I think as I'm, as I'm older now and not as pulled by having little kids underfoot, which I loved that time, but now I have more time, I'm, that's what I'm focused on. And, and more experience is focusing on blurring those lines so that that spiritual comes in and it makes it more How fun. do you do that? Well, it's not like I do it. It's not like that. I think, first of all, the intention yes. to be there. The intention of wanting every day, every minute of the day, to be more present. Yes. You know, there's things medit I meditate daily, um, and uh, yoga is headspace is meditation app I love. Mm -hmm. And I'll get any money from it, but I just want to say it's fabulous. Um, yoga is, to me, great exercise, just feeling good like that. And surrounding yourself by people who lift you up so that you can lift them up. It's that having compassion for yourself so you can have passion for others. Beautiful. Thank you, Sarah. So I want to just say a few words about what we learned today. First of all, you saw the uh, combination in our last uh, dialogue here between the spiritual and the concrete, the everyday life, and her desire to blur the edges, really to have a multiplier effect. Also, she talked a lot about community and associating collegially and also coming from a point of service, which is quite different from throwing your weight around. And uh, really hearing people, and we know from her engineering and from this last project, the Canopy Walk, that she's fully capable of switching from the artistic to the basics, you know, and she's very good at research and follow through. These are lessons you can take in your life, and I, I, I have a bias towards uh, husbands and wives trying new things together. I think it's good. I think it's good for friends, too. It's good for yourself. So be curious, be alive, and remember, go out and do something kind today for someone you know and someone you don't know, and repeat it every day. But I have a more discreet thing to ask. Smile at someone. Just send up some positive energy, and I'll see you next week. Thank you, baby. To contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones the Spark. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.